Allahu Allahu Allah Allahu Allah I have not turned on the Xfinity in that car because I haven't had time to turn on Xfinity in the car. I haven't even had time to turn the radio on. And to be honest, I'm trying to decrease my time on the radio and trying to listen to more and more Quran because you know it, it, there's there's a power in the recitation and the and the, the, the Quran. And, and I'm thinking to myself, people are just so, we're just running one place to the other, waiting for the weekend, TGIF, right? Muslims post on Facebook, TGIJ, I don't know, you got all these, and people are just busy, and then Sunday night, people are like, oh my God, I gotta work tomorrow, and then Monday morning, like, oh man, I gotta go, people are complaining. And life just carries on, it's moving, it's just passing by. You know, the last time I was here was June 12th of last year. It doesn't feel like it was that long ago. I mean, I was just here. And then I was just here for a fundraiser. I don't know when it was, like what, three months ago? And you had no parking lot? But like, if you saw so it's like, no, no, in Mount Dara, that was two years ago. Right? I mean, it's just time peaks. Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam reminded us to account for ourselves before we went to sleep every night. Account. Stop. Reflect. Where are you? Where are you going? What's your journey? Are you preparing for your journey or not? Right? Because in essence, everything that we do in this life, it's in relation to the hereafter. Whether we like it or not, whether we acknowledge it or not, whether we like to think about it or not, but that's the reality of the situation. It's all in regards, it's all in relation to the hereafter. It's all in relation to the hereafter. And the Prophet Wasallam's life, if we look at it, his, his entire existence, right, his entire existence, everything was about the hereafter. If it was beneficial in the hereafter, he did it. If it was not beneficial in the hereafter, he didn't do it. It was all about the hereafter. People don't like to talk about death. People don't talk, like to talk about funerals. People, are, people just don't want to talk about it. They say, why, why would you bring this up? Why can't you talk about something happy? I'll tell you why. Because the Prophet ﷺ was Bashir and a Nadir. He gave glad tidings, but he warned too. And it behooves us to recognize, to realize, to understand that day by day, I'm, I'm slowing down, I'm getting, I'm, I'm closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's not a bad thing. Being closer to the mulaqat with Allah is not a bad thing. I honestly, like I sometimes think about it like, well, you know, it's actually, come to think of it, it's actually pretty cool. I don't have to worry about paying bills, no rent, no going to work. You know what I'm saying? Like, but it's good. Death is good for one who has prepared for death. If you haven't, if we haven't, if I haven't prepared, and I'm not saying I've prepared for my death, but as individuals, we need to continuously think about it and work towards it and prepare for it. Because if we don't, if we're, we'll dread it, we'll fear it, we'll be scared. Now, naturally, of course, there's a natural fear of death because it's the unseen. No one knows what's happening on the other side. No one knows what it feels like. But in reality, if we've prepared for it spiritually, if we are, our account with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is as good and as clean, as good as it can be, then inshallah, there will be nothing but blessings in the hereafter. But that's something we... Can, and by the way, Reflection on death is not something that we just do in the masjid. Reflection on death is not something that we do once a month or in the month of Ramadan or when it's time to give zakat. It's a daily reflection. And the daily reflection is not like, okay, I'm going to spend the next five minutes thinking about death. No! When you're having a meal, there needs to be reflection on death. When you're at the shopping center, there needs to be, like, is this really beneficial for me in this life and the hereafter or not? Am I making the right decision or not? Because everything that we do in this life will affect the life of the hereafter. Either we prepare for it or we don't. It's as simple as that. But in reality, all of our time is coming to an end. Now, I understand, inshallah, may Allah give all of us long lives, say ameen. 
May Allah give all of us healthy lives. And I mean, right? It's not like we're asking for death tomorrow. Or, no, no, no. May Allah give us long. May Allah give our children and our progenies long and happy lives. But that in their daily reflection, in our daily reflection, we are we are thinking about this mulaqat with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how I'm going to make this mulaqat with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a beautiful one, a beautiful one and a blessed one. That how my account with Allah is clean. Whether I am acknowledged, I'm a masjid volunteer, I'm a masjid board member. I, whether I'm acknowledged in this life or not for, my, for what I do, doesn't matter. As long as my acknowledgement is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In fact, the less the acknowledgement in this dunya, the more acknowledgement in the hereafter. That's the rule of Allah. Right? The lesser the acknowledgement here, the better. Right? That's how much more you have in the hereafter. The more the acknowledgement here, the less we have in the hereafter. Because all of a sudden, what happens? Oh, this brother, this, alhamdulillah, you know, we're going to name this room after you, and this, that, and the other, and all of a sudden, the shaitan, and you start boasting and feeling pride, all of a sudden, the reward is gone. Right? So the less in this dunya, the more in the hereafter. The less the people know of our good, the more with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As long as, what's our goal? Our goal is that on the day of judgment, the angels recognize us. Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam recognizes us. Honestly, like, think about it. Imagine your whole life, no one recognizes you for any good that you do. But on the day of judgment, Nabi alayhi salam recognizes you. That's it. You're done. You have a life of eternity of goodness. And imagine being recognized day in, day out in this life for everything that you do and not being recognized in the hereafter. It's all up loss. Like, really, we need to think about it at times. Like we just need to, you know, we live in a land where, you know, we have resumes and bios and we like, like to praise people and people, if you, you know, you praise yourself and you, you know, people do all of these things. Sometimes it's a moment of reflection. Ya Allah, that's why, that's why the ulama, the scholars, the pious predecessors used to make, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, accept that which we're doing. Because if there's no acceptance, there's nothing for us in the hereafter. And really, it's just, Honestly, it's about reflecting. I've, 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 I've experienced the loss of one too many people in the last few months. And it's really slowed me down and got me to start thinking. I just start, and I'm not saying, I'm like, oh my God. Like, no, I'm just starting to think, like, you know, it's, what's life about? What, what is the meaning of life? Why am I here? You know, I guess I, maybe, maybe I'm just getting close to 40 and that's what happens. I don't know. Help me out here. You know, I'm, 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 I've hit 35. And I'm, I'm just really, you know, I'm just like starting to think like, you know, there was a time when you, you were the king of the world. My brother and I were a year apart. Some of you know us. And honestly, just a few, few weeks ago, one of our friends texted us around 8 o'clock. He goes, let's go out for dinner. And I'm thinking, okay, if we go out for dinner now, 8.30, Order food, come back, be 10.30, gotta make a little prayer, I shall wake up at five, nah, you know what, I, was like, I can't make it. Man, we both looked at each other, you know, we knew exactly what we were. I'm like, you know, we're getting old here. Because <laughs> about 10 years ago, you were to tell me to go to San Francisco at 11 o'clock at night, well, yeah, sure, meet you at 12 o'clock, we'll see, you know. It's just slowing down. And I'm not saying slowing down in a bad way, slowing down in a good way, that, you know, going to sleep on time, Waking up for Fajr. You know, if I'm not tired of Fajr time, maybe I can recite some Quran. Remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because really it's just, you know, like, where am I going with all of this? Where am I going with all of this? Nice car, and then what? New car, and then what? Right? Big house, and then what? You know, nice clothes, and then what? Fancy wedding, and then what? You know, like, What's happiness? What is, ha honestly, honestly, happiness is in being content. There is no greater happiness in the world than being content with what we have. If we can be content with what we have, there's no, because if you, if, because the moment we start reflecting on, oh, well, they got this, we got to have it. Maybe, you know, look at, oh, wow, did you see their car? Did you see the new Tesla that just came out? You know, now you're thinking, you know, you're up. You know, it's like, it's just one thing. Where do you stop? I was at which point do you stop? I had a, I had a, a 
very as you're here for me, you call me in Atlanta, you're in town for the weekend, I'll give you one of three options. Okay? A Porsche Panamera, because you can have it for the weekend. A Porsche Panamera, a Bentley Continental, or a Rolls Royce Ghost. Okay, that was those are my options. Now I'm thinking it's not that's not bad, you know. I can do one of those, any one of those. I chose the ghost. Okay? It was at Ontario Airport. Had it with me for two days. I was with a very dear friend of mine. And honestly, yeah, it's a nice car. It's a fun car. It drives well, no doubt about that. But there were so many times when he and I were so engaged in conversation, we didn't know what car we were sitting in. And we didn't even realize that people were looking at us. And it dawned on me, it's just a car. Honestly, yeah, it cost maybe $300,000 you know, more than my house, but it's just a car. And for me to be conscious and obedient to Allah and work on my hereafter, it doesn't matter what I drive. If you're going to judge me by the type of car that I drive into the masjid parking lot, I tell you, I figured something out. I don't want to be your friend. I don't need friends like that. I'd rather not have friends. Really, honestly, I've, I've, I've been content, like, you know, people have these really busy social lives on Saturday nights, invited to parties, and if you don't get invited to a party, oh my God, why didn't they invite me? Is everything okay? You know, she invited all the other my friends, I didn't get invited. Did I say something? Did I do something? You know, like, people worry about all these things. I'm like, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, I get to spend an evening on a Saturday night at home and throw the football around with my kids. You know, get to play a game of tackle football on a Saturday. You know what? I, I don't have to dress up and go somewhere. I just saved an hour of my time. I get to pray my salah on time. I get to be content. Being content. And that's when you, this, on this whole greater picture of life. Because like greater people need to just stop and begin contemplating. Start thinking. That what is it that we really need in this life? What is it that we really need in this life? And think about the hereafter. Otherwise, I tell you, in the land that we happen to be living in, we are taught, we are trained, subconsciously trained to the sky's the limit. And the sky's the limit in terms of what? In terms of dunya. Not in terms of the hereafter. Let me ask you a simple question. What surah did I recite in the second rak'ah? Okay, don't answer the question. Do you even remember what I recited in the second rak'ah? For those of us that do, right? For those of us that do, how many of us, and this is a question to myself, not you, how many of us can translate that surah word for word and understand it? It's a simple question. And for those of us that can translate it, how many of us can know, know when this surah was revealed? Why was it revealed? Why was it revealed? Where was Nabi Muhammad when this came down? We have time, we have time to work hard to own a bigger house. We have time to make a payment on a new car. But you tell someone I want an hours of your time on the weekend to understand and remember the meaning of the surahs that we recite in Salah. We'll go for two weeks, maybe three weeks, maybe four weeks. And the moment you start getting homework, you say, I can't do this, I'm too old now. You know what? Most people are too old for fancy cars anyways. I, I, I usually beat people on a freeway in my Hyundai that are driving BMWs. It's like, it's like give me your car, you know what I'm saying? You don't even deserve that car. You're not doing it as due justice. Do, do you get where I'm coming from? Like this is, it's honestly about reflection. And, and time, honestly, wallahi, wallahi, brothers and sisters, I'm not here, I mean, I'm talking to myself right now. Honestly, I'm talking to myself. Right, because I have the same 24 hours that you do, and you have the same 24 hours that I do. I have the same challenges that you do and you have the same challenges that I do. We all have bills to pay. 
We all have to pay for our living, our accommodation. We have gas to pay for. We have car insurance we need to pay for. We have health insurance that we need to pay for. Some of us may have family and friends back home that we are trying to support. Right? You and I are all raising children. You have children that you're raising. I got children that I'm raising. I got to deal with the challenges just as your children deal with challenges in public school. I have, I have challenges that I'm dealing with in public school. I think we're all, brothers and sisters, we're all in this together. Right? We're all in this together. There's no one more superior than the other. Right? No one, no one's more superior than the other. Superiority in akramakum and Allahi atqaqum. Superiority is with taqwa. And Allah is the one who will decide taqwa. Not us. Maliki yawiddin. Allah is the owner of the day of judgment, not human beings. Allah will judge us. He's the judge, not human beings. We can't judge. I can't judge you. You can't judge me. I don't know a thing about you. You don't know a thing about me. Uh, yeah, you may know me, but that doesn't mean you know me. Right? We know each other. But honestly, you don't know who I am. You don't know what my daily challenges are. You don't know if I prayed Fajr this morning or not. You don't, honestly, don't. You don't know if I prayed Fajr this morning or not. I don't know if you recited Surah Ka'af or not. Today was Friday. We should have recited Surah Ka'af. I don't know if you recited Surah Ka'af or not. Don't. People have... So think, just reflect. Honestly, <coughs> brothers and sisters, my message is a, is a message of reflection. That this time that we have, that Allah has bestowed us with, what do we do with it and how do we spend it? Is it meaningful? Are we doing something with it? Is it meaning? Are we doing something with it? Are we preparing for this mulaqat with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And it's not difficult. Honestly, I've been trying to tell people around me these days, simplify, simplify, simplify. You don't need a five-bedroom home. You don't even need a four-bedroom home. Half of us don't even need the cars that we drive. Simplify, simplify. Honestly, just try to do it. We don't need to be purchasing clothes every few months. We don't need to be purchasing new shoes for every, every party that we go to. You don't need to have a coach purse or a coach bag. And you don't need to have Chanel sunglasses. I think, like, think about it. People are just so caught up. The world, go to the mall. TV tells us you got to have it. You got to have it. Right? More is more. Don't you have the ad? The AT&T TV commercial? Yeah, I have a TV at home. You got a problem with that? More, the the AT&T U-verse ad? More is more, because more is more. And when you have more, I have people just out or after it. And if there's, if there's really something more of what we need is Allah, is His Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in our lives. We need to be able to figure it out with balance how to bring Nabi Alayhi Salaam into our lives. With balance. With balance. I'm not saying all of a sudden go all religious on me. Right? With some balance. Yet at the same time, at the same time, our entire existence needs to be Islamic. Our entire existence needs to be in obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What do I mean by that? It's very common. It's very common for a parent, and to give you a simple example, for a parent to come to the Imam of the Masjid. You know, they call the Imam of the Masjid, Imam Tahir, Imam al I need to see you. And you say, sure, come on by. As if I have some magic pills in my office that I can give to you when your child is not listening to you. I can give you those pills, you can take it home and give it to the child, and all of a sudden, miraculously, your child's going to listen to you. That don't begin when your child is 15. Okay? That doesn't even begin when your child is 2. That doesn't even begin when you get married. This journey begins before you get married. Raising pious children, raising obedient children is a journey that begins before you get married when you choose your spouse. Because this spouse is going to be the father of your child or the mother of your child. Do you really want this person to be the mother of your children? Do you really want, do you really want this guy to be the father of your children? That that's when the journey begins. So when you're 15 and I get a phone call that says, you know, Imam Tahir, my child is not listening to me, I'm going to bring them to you. You know, brothers and sisters, I've got some news for you. I don't have a magic pill in my office. As far as dua, 
your dua is more worthy for your child than mine. Because Nabi alayhi salam says that every child, every parent's dua for a child is an accepted dua. Okay? The same Quran that I have is the one that you have in your home. The same ahadith of Nabi alayhi salam I have are the same ones that you have. Right? Think about it. But you get this phone call and say, you know what? I want, to, I want to bring my child to you and I want you to talk to me. And then, when the child is away for a few minutes, the parent begins to cry. And what does the parent cry? I pray five times a day, I reply. I pray five times a day. I give my zakah every year. I'm fasting in the month of Ramadan. Why would I not do this to me? Why do I have such a disobedient child? Because many of the acts of worship that we do are nothing but rituals. We're not necessarily obedient to Allah. Obedience to Allah is in our entire existence. Obedience to Allah is in our entire existence. Right? Think about it. What's our entire... From being honest to people, kind to people, just to people, kind to your neighbors, not cheating at work. Right? Not leaving work early just because you can get away with it. Simple things. Simple things. Right? Just because I, ha just because I have money doesn't mean I have to spend it. Whether my lifestyle is a is a medium lifestyle, because Nabi Allah Subhanahu wa Taala reminds us in the Quran, "Wala tubathir tabthira inna al-mubathirin kanu ikhwan al-shayatin." People who waste money are the brothers of the shayatin. Right? That when we walk into the shopping center, we don't have to be at Nordstrom and Macy's all the time. Honestly, if you came to my house and if I gave you a drink, would it really matter? if it was purchased at Macy's or Walmart? Like, think about it. Right? Now, I'm not saying don't go to Macy's. I'm not saying don't buy Mikasa. Okay? But Mikasa can be $900 or $200. You know, like, at which point do you draw the line? Obedience to Allah is in everything that we do. And all of a sudden we begin to think that Islam and, and, and men, I'm not saying, I'm not pointing fingers at anyone, but sometimes there's many of us who are obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but when it comes to family relations, we fail. I haven't talked to my brother in two years, I haven't talked to my sister in three years. Right? When we talk about our spouse's parents, we have nothing but bad to say about them. Just because they've been bad to you doesn't give us the right to be bad to them in return. Sulman Qata'a, Nabi alayhi salam says, mend relations with those who break them with you. If, if, if you're nice to me and I'm nice back to you, what's the big deal? What's the big deal? If you're mean to me and then I'm nice back to you in return, that is a Muslim. That is one who is obedient. So when we talk about remembering Allah, worshipping Allah, we need to bring obedience into our entire existence. And obedience is not just in the way you dress or the way you look. Let me be real here. Obedience is being, being thoughtful at all times, being conscious at all times, being aware at all times. Like what are you doing? Who are you doing? You know, just everything that you do in life. Are we wasting money? Am I wasting my time? Am I wasting my, am I wasting my energies? I mean, the average... Even, no, let's not talk. You know, we, we parents want to bring their children to the lecture of the Imam so that the children listen. Let's talk about the parents. Okay? If you have a habit of going to sleep late, 11, 12, 1 o'clock, that's what your children are going to do. Now, there will come a time when you get old and you can't stay up till 1, but they've seen you stay up until 1, that's what they're going to do. If they've at any point in their life seen you miss your Fajr prayer, there's going to be a point in their life when they're not going to pray Fajr. It's just, it's bound to happen. It's bound to happen. I've seen it. I've seen it. I tell you, I've, I've said this story so many times, I'm almost tired of saying it now, but I had a parent come to me recently. Okay? This is what season. What season are we in right now? What happens in June? May, June. Summer vacation. What happens before summer vacation? Graduations. What else happens during this season? Prom. Thank you. Uh, someone remember? Proms. You know what prom is, right? No? Oh my god. <laughs> prom is the night when your 12th grader in high school 
home loses his or her virginity? The average kid, right? No. Illa mashallah, there are people, but that's, you know, it's, it's a night where you go out, you have, you have a date, it's a girl, a guy, hopefully. Um, you rent a limo, you go out, you dance, you drink, you have fun. People look back at the proms and the graduation. It's a big thing in the society that we happen to be living in. A child, now you have three kinds of children. I figured this out. I've analyzed this. You have three kinds of children. A, one who says, you know what, I don't need to be at a prom. I'm a Muslim. I'm fine where I'm at. It's not right for me. I don't need to be around friends, singing, dancing, drinking. I don't need to be there. Alhamdulillah. You know, I got, I got friends. I can be with my friends. I can go out and eat. You know, Alhamdulillah, parents are supportive, you know. Go out or we'll do whatever you want. That's one kind of child. The second one says, you know what, I'm a Muslim child. I'm going to go to the prom with my friends of the same gender. And I'm going to be with my friends. And I'm not necessarily going to dance or anything. And you know, I'm just going to have a good time because it happens to be the end of the year and it's a prom and whatever. Then there's a third Muslim child who says, you know what, I'm going to the prom. Okay. Now, just because you think your child is not at the prom doesn't mean your child is not at the prom. And I'm dealing with a case right now where I know the child has purchased the tickets for the prom, but the parents don't know. And you know what? I'm not going to tell the parents. And I'll tell you why I'm not going to tell the parents. It's because when the parents find out, all hell is going to break loose. And if you're going to reprimand your children, all hell cannot break loose. The Prophet says, never reprimand a child in anger. That's a hadith. Never reprimand a child in anger. Child does something wrong. Wait 24 hours before you do, before you reprimand them. Because otherwise you're angry. Your anger is going to make it worse. And then they're going to, your children, and then they're 18, they're going to call you insane because you do it every two weeks. No, this is very real. You do, I, hope you, I hope you do. I'm not making fun of parents here. I hope parents, I hope parents realize this. Like, this is very real. Children don't like to be lectured. I tell you, it's not easy. When my parents were reprimanding me, it was a different style, different time, different day. You listened and it was okay. If I'm going to use the same style with my children, it's probably not going to work. So what do I do? Honestly, Allah is my witness. Allah is my witness. And Allah is my witness. On the few occasions I've had to reprimand my child, I've never done it right when I was angry. And before I decided to talk to my child, I prayed two rak'ah. I made wudu, prayed two rak'ah, I made du'a to Allah. Ya Allah. Ya Allah, I want what I say to my child to be meaningful to this child of mine. To be meaningful. Because I, he doesn't need to be obedient to me. He needs to be obedient to you. He needs to be obedient to you. And as long as he has obedience in his heart and his mind of Allah, then there's nothing that can affect this child. I just think about it. And so this child comes to me. This parent this child tells the parent, the senior tells the parent and says, Mom, Dad, I'm going to the prom. Of course, all hell first broke loose. And then they came to Imam Tahir because Imam Tahir has these magic pills in the masjid. You know, they came to Imam Tahir and you know, they came to me and said, Hey, can you explain my child? And I said, Sure, you know, I'll see what I can do. I'll try to figure it out and maybe they'll listen to me. And sometimes children do. May Allah bless and reward the amazing young children. I mean, you know, but I mean, but I tell you, this child had an argument that I had no counter-argument for. If you're from the Indo-Pak world, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Afghanistan, at least I can speak about India, Pakistan, I won't say about Afghanistan, or any other part of the world, but we have, we have a wedding, Shadi wedding. The day before the actual wedding, we have a Hindu ceremony. What do we call it? Yeah, yeah, come on, say it loudly. Mehendi. You know what a mehendi is, right? Mehendi is the henna. Henna is mehendi. But it's a ceremony where people come together, family is fed, then people sing, and then they dance, and they have a great time because weddings only happen once in your life, right? That's why you can make all the mistakes you want. I tell you, my heart cried the day this child told me this and I felt sorry for the parent bringing that child into my office. <coughs> this child said, Imam Dhamar, before you talk to me, can I say something? And I said, yes, go ahead, my child. 
this child said, My parent is telling me that I can't go to the prom because it's haram to sing and dance or whatever with a non-mahram. How is it halal for my mom to sing and dance at a mehendi in front of non-mahram men? This is a very real argument. And you know what? I honestly, I feel sorry for the parent because the parent just got all flustered, red, I was quiet, and they left. And they left. And I thought to myself on that day that as a parent, as a parent of my children, of my Muslim neighbor's children, of my non-Muslim neighbor's children, I need to be a positive example. I need to be, as a parent, a positive example at all times. Then how do I set that example? I set that example by ensuring that I, as a parent, happen to be in good company at all times. That I don't go to the masjid when it's convenient for me. I don't go to the masjid when it's convenient for me. I don't become God obedient when it's convenient for me. That I remain God obedient to the best of my ability at all times. That I am obedient to Allah and anticipate and pray that my child also becomes obedient to Allah. And this was a, 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 a I, I, I was a few weeks ago, maybe four or five, I can't remember, six, seven weeks ago, I was in um, Ottawa. And there was a. Um, um, an author, a, a, a psychologist, and an, an individual, an elderly individual, who has authored um, many, many books on uh, marriage and child rearing in Islam. His name is Dr. Ridal Bashir. Dr. Ridal Bashir, very humble man, very humble man. I, I'm, I'm glad to meet men as humble as him. Very humble man. And he, he simply said, you know, he was giving. I asked him for advice. I said, you know, I, I get to go. Allah has blessed me with this ability to go to places and talk to people, please give me some advice. And this was the sunnah of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. They would seek advice. They would go to the Prophet ﷺ and say, Oh, Sunni, give me, give me advice. And it behooves all of us, no matter how old we become, that the people who are older than us, we go to them and say, give me advice. So I said, Oh, Sunni, give me advice. And he gave me one piece of advice that I will never forget. He goes, when it comes to raising children, our job is not to connect them to you. Our job is not to teach them salah. Our job, and he was being general. Our, our job is ensuring that they become obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the moment they become obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they will then take this responsibility and ensure that they fulfill their, their obligations to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and their obligations to the community. And of course that includes everything else, praying a lot, reciting the Quran and so on and so forth. So, where are we at? This life, is an amana. This life is an amana. And we all have time. All of us have time. We need to figure out, each one of us, what we decide, what we plan to do with the time that we have. It's okay to have fun, but make sure it's meaningful. It's not non-meaningful fun. You know what I'm saying? Like, make sure it's meaningful. You're actually doing something. You're on a hike, for example. It's good for your health. I mean, make sure it's meaningful. Make sure that the environment at home is so blessed and so kind that you're not always looking forward to a vacation. Make sure that the professions that we have, and many of us have this option, some of us don't, and we understand that. May Allah reward you for the difficulty that you go through for putting food on the table and shelter over our families. There's a great reward in it. Don't forget that. Right? The more the difficulty, the more the reward. But for those of us that have options, why? Why does the average Muslim professional male choose to work 80 hours a week? Now, some of us may not have a choice. It's a competitive market. I understand. But how come, how come we have expenses that even after eight, working 80 hours a week and getting a fatter and a fatter and a fatter paycheck, we're still not going anywhere with it? 
Why is it that the more money we make, the more our expenses grow? Why aren't we working backwards, ensuring that day in, day out, with all the money that I have right now, I'm preparing a life and a future where I can survive on lesser and lesser money rather than more and more money? No, think about it. The people don't, the fi- you want to talk about financial planning? I'm from a state of India. We're Gujaratis. Okay? We're Gujaratis. All we do is think numbers. We're just business minded. You know how certain people, certain clans, we are very business minded people. We don't necessarily work for anyone. Okay? Around the world, we're known for having businesses. Okay? 70% of the motels in the United States are owned by Gujaratis. In this case, they're Hindus, they're not Muslims, but what I mean to say is that we're business minded. That's why when I, sometimes when I'm traveling and I walk into a hotel or a motel and I see the name tag, they never guess I'm Gujarati. It's great, because they think I'm an Arab, maybe Pakistani, but never in India. I never a Gujarati. And I'm thinking, you want financial planning? Financial planning is not necessarily buying a six bedroom home at the age of 40 with a 30 year mortgage. I think about it. Why would you, why would you do that? Why would you? Like, I'm thinking, why would you do something like that? <clears throat> Simplify our lives. Make our lives meaningful. Do things in our lives that have meaning to them. Volunteer. Worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Find a house close to the masjid. Be at the masjid regularly. Last year my father moved to the United States. After three months he said, I'm out of here. And by the fourth month he was gone. And I was almost convinced that he's moving. You know, I was excited. Dad, Mom and Dad are going to live with us. And you know what his number one reason was for leaving? He said, there's no masjid close to your house. You can't do that. Closest masjid was four miles away, 10 minutes drive. Not too bad, no freeway. He could have driven my little car. He said, that's too far for a masjid. 10 minutes away from this long? No way. Can't be right next door. So my brother and I, we actually released an office space two weeks ago, a mile from my house, and we started this small muscle leather in anticipation that dad will come out here, inshallah. But really, think about it. Right? People want to move away, get bigger homes. And, and make lives difficult. Right? The older we get, you know, the older we all get, I'm getting older. Right? My, my, what's my desire? This should be our desire to pray the maximum number of prayers in congregation at the masjid. Right? To worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That at 8 o'clock, I'm not worried about going to work. When I'm 40 years old, 45 years old, I'm not worried about going to work. I have to be at work. And I can, no, no, no. But, and people have, if you're young, if you're in your 20s and 30s and you've got an education here, you probably have a half decent education and you're probably making half decent money. Don't spend it on your BMW leases and your expensive you know, phone bills and this, that, and the other. Plan. Plan. The Prophet ﷺ taught the companions to plan. That by the time you reach a certain age, that we should be praying at the masjid more and more regularly. We should be devoting more time to the obedience and worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That we should be reciting more and more Quran. That's what we've been created for. There's dhikr. Right? There's dhikr. Remembrance of Allah. That we're reciting more Quran. That we're making more dhikr. We're remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But we don't think about these things. We're just busy. We're just busy. We're just carrying on. I'm just carrying on. You get a job that gives you more money, we'll take it. Right? The HR manager of a very large, this person is the VP of HR in a very renowned and large company in, in the Silicon Valley. He's a dear friend of mine. And he once, I was just talking, I was just bouncing some ideas off of him. And he once said that it's not about how much, and this is, you know, good friends give you good advice. He said it's not about how much money you make. It's not about how much money you make. It's about how much comfort you have at the job that you're at. It may give you less money. You may have lesser things in life. But as long as it's a, you know, you have a work-life balance, you're not stressed out at work, you're not stressed out at home, sure, you won't be able to buy the BMW that you want to buy. You won't be able to buy the house that you want to buy. You won't be able to go on vacations like everyone else. But you'll have a balanced life. At least you'll be happy. You'll need some contentment for that. So the time, and you know, summer's coming up. When I think of summer now, Alhamdulillah, Ramadan is in summer. But when I think of summer, especially a lot of young people, what do we do? Video games, video games. All day we're on video games. Chatting to people, Facebook. Right, just wasting time. Just standing around talking. Right, just...
just hanging out with friends, sleeping late, waking up late. The Prophet ﷺ sunnah was sleeping early and waking up early. Right? The Prophet ﷺ would sleep after Salat al Isha, and he would wake up at the half of the night. And that's why good company, you know, uh, my grandfather was a, an old man, he was a very strict and principled man, and for as long as he lived, I was, you know, it's just like, you know, like, oh my God, man, he's an old beanie, you know what I'm saying? But now, in hindsight, I look back and say, you know, we got to learn a lot from him. He had, he had one rule. He used to have a lot of guests. He was an old scholar. Many, many people would come and visit him, and they would stay at our house. And, you know, this is a house in a village, so it's generally safe. You have large patios. Your, your guest's bed is set outside. There's a bathroom outside that they use. You know, they leave a glass of water. And I remember when we would have guests, it's either my brother or I, it was our responsibility to put the bed out for the guest to put a table next to the best uh, for the guest, a bottle of water, a glass, you know, a flashlight. We lived in the village, a flashlight, show them where the bathroom was. And my grandfather would sleep right after, no matter who came, he would sleep right after Isha. He would sleep. And I still recall once a very, a very renowned scholar uh, came to town. And he knew my grandfather for many years, and he found out where I was. He, you know, requested me to, to, to go to where he was. I went there and he says that I know your grandfather is sleeping because I've known him for many years. But I want you to open the room of his door just so I can see him. I just want to see him. I'm not going to wake him up. And so that's what he did. He came into my house, quietly opened the door and he went into my grandfather's bedroom and he just saw my grandfather. Now in the meantime, my grandfather woke up and this is a different story. But, but you know, just... I tell you, there's another, there's this, this thing that, I, you know, when my parents were here last year, when my children would wake up in the morning at 7 o'clock, you know, people, people think about parents as being burdens, right? Oh my God, you know, you have to take them places that they don't drive, they live in your house so you have to cook for them, they live in your house so your expenses go up. We think of all these weird things. I don't know where people get all of this. I tell you, one of the reasons why I really want my parents to start living with me is because when my, when, my, when my kids would wake up for school in the morning, he would see both, or they would see both their grandparents seated next to each other on a prayer rug, either reciting Quran, making tasbih, because for an hour and a half after bed, that's what they do. That's what the kids see. Right? And so I'm thinking to myself, when mom and dad are not around, what are they seeing? What are they seeing? Are they just seeing Beyblades and Spongebob and God knows what else? Right? Or are they seeing their parents doing, you know? So when we talk about time, time is passing by. Time is moving really, really fast. Let's become conscious. All of us, myself, you, let's become conscious. Spend your time doing good. Play, play with your children. Play with them. That's good time spent. You're bonding with your children. Right? They want to play with you. Yesterday, I, I left early today, but these days, because the days are long and I go to the masjid a little late for Maghrib, between Asr and Maghrib, I, I, play, I play football with my kids. Now, I'm not really in that much good health to play football, but you know, I mean, they're little kids, so I can still beat them. In about two years, the thing will, things will be different. But let's think about it. Right? As we get older, as all of us, as I, as I get older, I want to recite more Quran daily. I want to become close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I don't want to be worried about the dunya and its bills. I don't care what car I drive. I don't care what kind of a home I have. I don't care if I don't get to go, get to, go to the mall every three weeks to buy a new pair of clothes. It's okay if I wear the same clothes or my wife wears the same dress again to like three different weddings. It's okay. It's not the end. Honestly, it's not the end of the world. It's not the end of the world. The world is not going to come crashing down if you wear the same dress over at a different wedding. Right? But you'll be able to maybe put some money away and have some financial security for putting these things together. And so we hope and pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the ability to reflect. Honestly, give us the ability to reflect. And that every time we do something, think twice before we do it. Do I really, do I want this or do I need this? Do I have to do this or do I need to do this? There's a difference. There's a distinction. Go to sleep early, wake up early, go for a job, go for a walk. Right? 
Good health is part of who we are. Join a gym for God's sake. No, really, join a gym. You know, start jogging, start running, take care of yourself, look after your health. Right? And then go to work. Come home early. Men, come home early. Your children need you. They don't just want you, they need you. And there's only a certain time in your life when you can be present in your children's lives. And if you're not there for them at that time, it'll be too late. I was at a wedding a few weeks ago and my son was next to me. My son's almost 12 and he comes up to my shoulders and an elderly auntie, one of my mother's friends, asked me, Ye kiska hai? For those of you that understand Urdu, she said, whose son is this? I go, it's my son. And she goes, Tera beta itna, itna bada kab se ho gaya. When did your son become this big? You're still a child. Right? And she's reflecting, 30 years ago I was a child. And she hasn't seen me in many years. And I'm thinking to myself, SubhanAllah, this child, I need to spend time with my children. I need to spend time with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As a parent, I need to ask Allah to inspire me to be a good parent. As a parent, I need, as, as an individual, I, as a neighbor, I need to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to inspire me to be a good neighbor to my neighbors. Right? As a leader of the community, I need to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the middle of the night and say, Ya Allah, inspire me to be a good person. Right? These are things that, if we're conscious, Allah Pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us and to protect us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ease our affairs. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our coming here. Don't ever, ever underestimate the value of any little good that we do. Right? What's mithqa? It's just almost non-existent in atoms worth. Science talks about atoms today. The Quran talked about atoms 1400 years ago. And atoms worth of good, don't underestimate it. We will see it in the hereafter. It's not going anywhere. But the more we do, the more we have. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all tawfiq. I want to thank you all for allowing me to be here to speak to you. And uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you. Your community has always been a blessing. One. Tracy, Mountain House, you are all amazing people. A lot of love in my heart for you people. And Imam Latif, give him some credit because he really had to track me down. And um, I think at some point he tried to blackmail me as well. So, so give him credit for, for me by being here. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward him and inspire him. You know, honestly, sometimes we take our imams for granted. Don't take them for granted. If you have someone in your masjid that leads salah, that teaches your children, that is amazing. Because let me tell you, I, I, I happen to uh, be on a forum where I'm probably sending out um, uh, tenders for imam jobs around the country almost three, four a week. Right? And these are, these are communities, I mean, very honest, these are communities that are paying at least, the starting salaries are 60, 70,000. Okay? For an imam, that's good to hear for people. Um, but for, that's good money. And so when we have someone in our community, let's not just take them for granted. Let us value them. And value doesn't mean to give them more money. Although that's good too, there's nothing wrong with that. Once in a while, give them a bonus. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm not saying that because Latif told me to. Um, but, Imam Latif, I apologize. But, uh, you know, value them by letting them know that they're valued. That you are an asset in our community. And may Allah reward you. Thank you for being with us. That we have a person who recites the Quran correctly. That knows the fiqh of wudu and fiqh of salah and pray, leads that prayer for us. Right? Is aware and is conscious. And remember, no human is ever perfect. Everyone makes mistakes. Everyone makes mistakes. So if we see someone doing something wrong, don't put them down. Right? Don't don't disrespect them. Everyone makes mistakes. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us and protect us. Amin ya Rabbil Alameen. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.